Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. I'm uh, Claudio Parcello. I'm co-chair of the Image Analysis and Data Fusion Committee of the IEEE GRSS. And I'm delighted to host this webinar, which is part of a, a series of webinar devoted to Earth's observation for the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, it is a collaboration between uh, two technical committees, IADF and, and uh, REACT. And the idea is to um, link the remote sensing community with people and organizations which are active in, in different fields related to uh, sustainable development goals, the monitoring and achieving uh, the SDGs. Today we focus uh, our attention on a very important topic is uh, land tenure security, which is connected uh, more directly to uh, the target 1.4 of the sustainable development goals, but is also connected to many other uh, SDGs and targets and indicators of the UN's uh, agenda. Today we have uh, three excellent speakers that will uh, talk about uh, the use of remote sensing for land administration applications and provide their uh, different views on this topic. And um, after this short introduction, I will then leave the, the floor to the three speakers uh, to give their presentations, which will be about 15 minutes. And at the end, we will have time for some discussion. Let me just check if, okay. I see still people in the waiting room, so I'm allowing them in good yeah i'm just looking we have quite a nice number of participants so uh, i would like now to introduce the three speakers um, we start with uh, dr rohan bennett uh, rohan holds a doctoral degree in geomatic engineering from the university of melbourne and is currently associate professor at Swinburne University of Technology, consulting in the areas of information systems, land administration, and spatial data infrastructure. He is also the incoming chair of FIG Commission 7 on cadaster and land management. Our um, second speaker is Dr. Mila Cueva. Uh, she is associate professor at the University of Twente, in particular, the Faculty of Geoinformation Science and Earth Observation, ITC. She holds a PhD and an MSc degree from the University of Architecture, Civil Engineering and Geodesy in Sofia. Her career includes 10 years of working in the photogrammetry department of GIS Sofia, producing cadastral and topographic maps, and three years of work experience in a private organization called MAPEX, leading uh, several European projects with geodetic, cadastral, and photogrammetric activities. Her main areas of expertise include digital twins, 3D modeling, image data acquisition and processing using different platforms and sensors, and automatic feature extraction for cadastral mapping, urban planning, among other applications. More specific, her uh, research focus is on the implementation of innovative geospatial and machine learning methods based on remote sensing in support of 3D urban modeling and cadastral applications. And our third speaker today is uh, Mr. Didier Sagashia. Sorry if my pronunciation is not correct. Um, he is the country manager for Medici land governance in Zambia since 2019. Prior to that, he was consultant with the World Bank Group and worked in Rwanda as public servant in various capacities for 14 years, where he served for seven, eight years as head of lands and mapping department, leading the systematic land registration of all land parcels, the creation of modern cadastral system and land administration information system. Mr. Didier served also as director general for uh, Rwanda Housing Authority, and as the executive chairman of Ultimate Concept, that developed the Kigali Convention Center and the Radiso Blue Hotel in Rwanda. And in 2017, he was the city manager for the city of Kigali. Okay. Um, after this, I'm very 
happy and very excited to hear your presentations and after that to discuss together with you uh, different aspects of land administration and how remote sensing can contribute to that. So I would like to start with the first speaker. So Rohan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Prosello, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone joining from around the globe in uh, different locations and different settings. Let me just uh, briefly interfere with this introduction and share my screen, and then we'll make, make a start. Yeah, so thanks very much to uh, the joint commissions here and the, the two organizations for coming together to essentially bring together another group of uh, domains, that being Earth Observation and Land Administration, which have a long and close history, but often, um, well, because both domains are so big um, and, and involve many facets, um, have not always worked uh, so close together. But I think uh, increasingly in, in the current era, we're finding more and more applications for Earth Observation in the domain of land administration, simply because of, of technology, in, in, technology innovation. Uh, but also the ease at which we can use those tools um, at, at perhaps not such a high level of expertise. And we'll sort of unpack that as we go along here. I think my job uh, is first speaker off the rank here is to try and set the scene a little. Uh, following me, you're going to hear from two real uh, experts in, in the domains uh, uh, and from an application point of view and also an R&D point of view. But just to set that scene first and to try and make that link really quite clear, um, I'll, I'll go through a few slides here to, to set that up. Um, so the title of the whole seminar is obviously based around SDG1, and I guess you have to be living under a rock if uh, you're not aware of what the SDGs are. Uh, those 17 goals uh, made up of numbers of indicators agreed upon by United Nations uh, with a goal towards 2030 in achieving those indicators. Uh, and specifically today and in this series, we're focusing on SDG number one, which is all built around uh, no poverty. But in this area of, of land administration and, and landscape management more generally, or land governance, you can see that land is a real cross-cutting theme in many of those SDGs, whether it be related to food and climate action or gender equality, that generally is a land or a spatial component linked to those. But focusing in on SDG number one, uh, the, the move towards eradication of extreme uh, poverty, uh, there's a number of indicators built around that. And you can see uh, if we look at that and you know, we can have all the debates we like around whether you know, the definition of what extreme poverty is, is useful or not, but that's what we're running with until 2030 at least. Um, you can see looking at these graphics here and you can see the, the sources coming from the World Bank there that you can see generally um, the, the, that's concentrated in the continent of Africa, but we shouldn't forget there that wherever you see a bit of pale yellow, there is, and some of those are OECD countries, there is still a level of um, what we would call poverty occurring in, in those countries. So SDG one is all about combating that through, oops, gone the wrong way there, through a number of uh, targets. And you can see here on the left-hand side, those targets, and then the specific indicators that we're focused on. And what we're really focusing in on today, and I've highlighted 1.3 and 1.4, but sorry, I should have only highlighted, highlighted 1.4, is the uh, target around uh, access to resources, really basic services, but that also includes access to land and land underpins a lot of or any, any uh, aspect of um, access to service and resources, having that access to land and availability of land, uh, information of land is quite crucial for that. And that's why you can see on uh, the indicator 1.4.2 uh, is that the specific indicator is around the proportion of total adult population with secure tenure is, is, that, is that indicator. And that's where the story of uh, land administration comes in. Um, so what about the, the numbers that we've currently got or the data that we've currently got around uh, that uh, particular target and indicator? Uh, you can see here, this is drawn from the same uh, UN site. Uh, again, you'll see a concentration around 
uh, the continent of Africa, West and, and South. But what you'll really notice in this graph is that there's uh, what is said to be no data. Now, in reality, there is data. It's just not available to the UN at this point. But in many cases, we don't have aggregated data. And certainly if we start trying to break it down and think about some of those other uh, SDGs, like those related to gender. So there's another uh, indicator, uh, 5.1.2. To be, and someone will correct me if I've just got that wrong, which looks at the women having uh, a higher percentage of docu land, uh, land documentation in their name. Um, and again, that's relies on have, being able to aggregate your national uh, land information system data in a way that disaggregates between uh, men and women. Uh, but you can see here, not a lot of data being reported back to the UN at all uh, on, on this SDG indicator 1.4.2. Um, which is a bit of a challenge because how do you prove that your uh, how do we show that we're moving in the right direction when we, we don't have data available to us and if we were to color in that graph with the knowledge that we have at the sort of country level uh, then in some of those we'd see um, at least with legal documentation uh, really heading towards that 80 and 100 percent level in a number of cases in many cases uh, within in, in particular in countries. And so why is that so important? Well, that's so important because of the simple equation that land plus person plus records about that uh, gives us uh, these benefits at an individual and both uh, governmental level. Uh, it, it helps, it doesn't in guarantee, but it does help to secure your ownership. So legal documentation is one way of proving ownership. Occupation is another. Uh, lack of dispute or conflict over the land is another. So there's a whole range of uh, these indicators and, and having this records linking the person to the land is a key one of those. Uh, it, which then in, in more developed context, as we want to call them that, uh, allows you to use that as collateral uh, to, to improve your land or improve the living conditions. Uh, and in general, find it easy to deal with land and we're having less litigation over land. So a good example of that is that in a country where you've got the basics of re records in place and, and access to land is recorded in a system that we call a cadastral land registry, you've got a far fewer number of uh, court uh, rulings or court ha occurrences happening in, in, in the courts. Uh, whereas when you don't, we know that the courts are often clogged, sometimes up to 70, 80% of cases are to do with land matters. Whereas in a, an OECD country, you're more likely to see in the tens or dozens of cases. So far, far less um, in numbers of cases. For government, the benefits are being able to apply fees or taxes across the land in a fair and transparent and responsible way, which can then help the common good. Uh, it gives governments a way of planning by providing an inventory of an existing situation. It enables them to enforce and understand the way their land transactions or controls might be working. So it's really a tool that starts to be used, especially in the digital age, across governments by many different agencies. And definitely through the COVID-19 pandemic, we really saw that uh, there was, a, there was a great need and use and want for spatial and particularly land tenure data uh, in responding to the crisis, but also the subsequent crisis around land tenure security and, and rental and, um, occupations and so on. So there are some of the benefits. And, and so this isn't new. This isn't something that's just come about through the SDGs. We've been doing this thing we call land registration or cadaster or land administration and more concretely or more broadly speaking, land governance for, for a long time. Uh, this um, rather old graphic sort of charts back that history um, in, in at least from a Western perspective uh, where we've seen the, the rise um, through different um, um, civilizations, I guess, uh, through to the creation and the move, the shift towards uh, individual ownership. Okay, that was sort of, it's a bit of a high ace on that or a bit of a challenge to that in, in the previous century. Uh, but in general, we've seen that this move towards uh, documenting uh, individual ownership as these different phases of development, different cycles of development have, have occurred. And it's been done in different ways in different times, depending on what technology we've had available to us. And it's always also been done for different reasons. And in the in the modern era, we have to talk about sustainability being the key driver around that. Uh, so much more to speak about on that, but I won't bore you more with that. You can go back and have a look at the more recent history around this space um, in, 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 in those documents just there. And as I said, the slides will be available and so is this presentation recorded. So the modern parlance around land administration looks something like this. We, the modern theory, 
every country is different. So every country does it a different way. We're in post the era of colonialism where everyone got the same cookie cutter model. Uh, you've got to have a solid land policy that builds from that country context, but every country, country context really needs to manage tenure value, land use and develop development in an organized way. It could be decentralized, could be centralized, but you've got to have some kind of uh, set up to manage those four functions and, and a land information infrastructure to support that. And overall, that should help us to achieve sustainable development. Drilling down a bit deeper, the cadaster itself is made up of two components, the spatial component and the non-spatial component. It's the textual component. That's normally the legal component. And but just focusing in on that spatial component, the spatial component is it's not like other forms of maps where we generally are only talking about this top bubble here, the physical boundary or the physical entity that we want to map. When it comes to cadastro, we've got a whole range of different other things going on. This is some work from Don Grant out of Australia and New Zealand, showing you the different components of a, a uh, cadastral boundary. So there's a documentation part which and a spatial part. So that's the spatial representation of the actual physical features on the ground. And all those components together go up to making the legal boundary. And that's really what we're trying to capture in a sense in the cadaster, um, in a conventional cadaster at least. Uh, but the problem is, and this is where the SDGs come back in, that we don't have a, a great uh, success or great evidence of those systems in the more formal sense being uh, created and working and sustained in many country contexts. Um, and the stat that's been buzzing around for the last 10 years, which gets often criticised, is that, uh, and I don't care that it gets criticised, it's, it's not a perfect statistic, but it does help to show that there is a, pro a large proportion of uh, unrecorded uh, land parcels globally. Whether they're secure or not is a different question, but we do know there's a lot of, uh, in, in many country contexts, uh, up to 70, 80% of the lands are not registered. Um, so the estimate is only 25% of the estimated 6 billion land parcels are formally registered, leaving 4 billion without land tenure security. That's a, probably a zombie statistic, as I've said there, because that lack of recordation doesn't necessarily mean lack of tenure security, but we often say it is a key ingredient for having it. If you want to know more, more about the zombie statistic, here's a nice little link there. You can read more on it there. So where does that bring us? Well, the traditional way of doing land administration in terms of that boundary capture work, and that's adjudication, surveying, demarcation, and mapping is done this way. And it's usually on the ground because on the ground, you've got a surveyor, a trusted intermediary who can talk to the people on the ground and help create that spatial uh, representation of the physical boundary that may or may not yet exist. And this is the typical tools we've done, done that with, plane tables, uh, theodolites and total stations. And that's great. And it, and it works in particular context where you've got enough skilled expertise to do it. And you've got enough time, money and space to do it. Uh, but going back to that statistic about the 75%, well, that's um, really, a, a troubling statistic in given we, when we look at the capacity of surveyors that are available to us. So there's been a great shift to find ways of speeding up and doing this at lower cost. And you can see all this kind of work coming out of GLTN, RICS, uh, UNFAO, um, FIG as well, to try and uh, build a global knowledge bank about how to do this work quicker in a, in a way that expedites the delivery of SDG1, for example. And fit for purpose is what uh, uh, Claudio was talking about when we opened the discussion. And fit for purpose land administration builds on all that traditional conventional land administration that we've been talking about, uh, but really focuses in on making the process quicker and really focusing on what the challenge is at hand. So not just using the theory textbook and, and rolling out what we've always done, but saying, okay, we've got a country of 25 million parcels. Uh, we don't have many surveyors. Maybe we've only got a dozen surveyors, but hey, we do have access to imagery, be it satellite or, or aerial imagery. And we do have a lot of uh, basic skill sets on the ground that can understand that imagery. So how can we go about bringing all that together to create a national parcel map? Uh, and we're going to hear about a great example of that when I stop talking in with the next speaker. Um, and so imagery and remote sensing and earth observation has started to become a really big part of land administration because of its ability to capture in really good detail the landscape in a relatively short amount of time when we compare it to doing total station surveys parcel by parcel. And, and the point of showing you this book is that there's more and more recorded evidence of, of that going around. So coming back to the surveyor, surveyor gets a bit tetchy when we say let's use imagery because his business model is about going parcel by parcel on the ground. And that's a bit of a threat to him. 
Uh, I can see you there, Claudia. So I know I've got two minutes left, I assume, or have I got less than that already? Two? I'm going to assume I got two, but you can tell me if I'm not otherwise. Okay. But that's not quite right from the land administration side, not quite right from the surveyors. There's now good evidence to show we've actually been using imagery from the time that imagery from aircraft or balloons has been available. And here's another document you can go and have a read about freely online with uh, the Remote Sensing Journal about that history and the development we've had over the last 150 years or so. Uh, it's not a new thing to use images to make parcel maps. And again, a whole lot of evidence there to support that. So I'm flicking through these because I know I'm out of time. Um, so I think that's a nice place to step up, uh, apart to, from to say a few more things, which will then flow nicely, I think, into uh, Miller's discussion on some of the innovations that are going around uh, about use of UAVs or automatic feature extraction um, to do this kind of work. But uh, just a few examples here to show you the different qualities of data that are available and how that helps us to do the work that needs to be done in terms of uh, not only capturing the boundaries of the parcel, but determining the value of them. Um, more work also on using that data. Once you've got the parcel map, you can start to do things like consolidating the landscape in a responsible way to, for example, improve upon SDG2 around food security. Um, this is going on right now where the fit for purpose approach, making use of imagery. So that image on the right hand side, and that's courtesy of uh, Malum, a partner that we work with in, um, uh, in um, Chad in Africa, where they're already piloting around the capital Yamna, uh, around making use of this approach and getting the local communities in to do their own mapping with the support and advice of a trusted intermediary. Uh, one other thing to finish on is that getting right back to where we started from, um, which is, oops, I've gone too forward. Um, if you do have that work being done, if you do create that parcel-based map, well, then you can then start to create the dashboards that are needed to populate uh, those SDG targets and indicators. And uh, that would help us fill in that map that I showed you very early on where there was a whole lot of no data being reported back to the UN. And that is, um, that is fact that we are really struggling around the data side of things to see how we're going along the track with many of the SDGs. Um, so the rise of the desktop surveyor is, is on. Is on. Uh, this is a little plug for uh, local Australian uh, professional body, the SSSI, and just to show you that this is really starting to make an impact, the real rise, and this happened during COVID as well, of the desktop surveyor, whether it be remotely piloting uh, a drone or capturing data remotely and then and, and processing in real time on, on, on your desktop from home. That, that's all really starting to happen, even in the cadastral space. So thank you very much. Where to next is that I'm gonna hand over to Mila and she's gonna give you an unpacking of some of the real innovations in R&D that are going on with Earth's observation when it comes to land tenure security. So thanks for your time. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks, Rohan. Great uh, introduction and overview of works on land administration. Um, yeah, I think you are now ready to go on with the presentation of Mila. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let me just share my screen. Yeah. Um, Claudio, just confirm that you see it full screen. Yeah. Not yet. No. You don't see it? Wait. No. Maybe I shared something wrong. <laughs> Uh, ah, okay. I didn't press the share button. Yeah, it's there now, yes. Okay, good. Um, okay, go to presentation mode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. Glory uh, here. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for inviting me to be part of this uh, seminar. Uh, and um, uh, today I will talk about innovative geospatial solutions for land tenure mapping. And it, my talk is really quite uh, very much linked to what uh, Rohan has said before and a very good continuation, uh, because as he also mentioned, uh, we would try to kind of focus on solving problems uh, related uh, with the Sustainable Development Goal 1, or more particularly, 
uh, as he also mentioned target 1.4, which means uh, equal rights and access to economic resources for all, which kind of we translate tenure security for all. Uh, and also, as Rohan has mentioned, um, there are 70% of land rights which are not recorded. So we have a, a lot of work to do, and we are trying to think how can we do that as fast and as efficient as possible. Uh, so as um, photogrammetrists and remote, especially, uh, remote sensing experts, we were thinking how to develop innovative solutions uh, based on all these technologies to make the land rights mapping faster, cheaper, and easier. Um, also, as Rohan mentioned, the classical traditional methods involve traditional surveying using uh, time-consuming grounds-based uh, measurements, like uh, you see on the screen with total stations and total lights. Uh, but having in mind that we want to speed this process, we were thinking of so-called fit-for-purpose land administration approach, where we can sacrifice a bit on the accuracy, but we can be more efficient and fast in reaching our final goal. Uh, so how did we approach this task? Um, as uh, I mentioned already, we tried to find an innovative approach, which is based on um, remotely sensed data, whether this is UAV or satellite imagery or aerial imagery, uh, which has been capturing the land. And we were trying to um, develop methods for automatic or semi-automatic um, feature extraction based on these high resolution images. You can see on the um, slide, the comparison between between the cadastral current approach and the proposed approach. And I will elaborate a little bit more in this uh, presentation about this. Uh, so we thought remote sensing can be a very uh, good solution for large unmapped areas, uh, especially with areas with limited number of land professionals. Uh, and we were thinking to explore and evaluate different techniques, automatic or semi-automatic, to detect visible cadastral boundaries. I'm emphasizing on the word visible uh, because not everything is uh, visible from an uh, um, aerial image. So we tried with the research of uh, a colleague of us, called Diviani Colli in uh, University of Twente, to uh, quantify the percentage of the completely visible cadastral parcels using different satellite images. Uh, and you can see on this slide um, that uh, automatic approaches really depend also on the quality of the images. Um, so you can see that visible boundaries are assumed, uh, are based on the assumption uh, that physical objects like fences, walls, or hatches, or rows that are demarcated on them are visible on these images. So it uh, also uh, shouldn't be uh, forgotten that uh, it requires also a, a local knowledge of understanding those images. So outlining these boundaries is really not a simple task uh, in a manual uh, world, uh, and it's even more harder in an automatic uh, world. Um, so uh, we started fighting with this, uh, let's say, task of creating uh, a tool or creating an approach uh, for automatic recognition of these uh, boundaries. And uh, you can see here on this slide, how many is the percentage of the visible cadastral boundaries? Uh, you can see that uh, from all the countries in this table, the percentage uh, varies from zero to 71. Uh, and these are only within the visible cadastral boundaries. Uh, you can see that the smallholder farms uh, and well-organized urban areas 
uh, have a significant potential in terms of visual boundary or parcel identification compared to large farms or um, hilly terrains. This was one of the conclusions. Um, and uh, uh, you can see that there is also a difference between rural, urban, and peri-urban uh, area. Also, there are images like in uh, this uh, table you see in Nepal that nothing is visible uh, on, from the aerial image. So the quality of the image is really extremely important. That was the message from this uh, research. Uh, then I would like to continue also uh, by introducing to you one project which was uh, finished last year. It was quite a big project related again with innovations uh, for land tenure mapping. Uh, it was a Horizon 2020 project uh, for four years for almost 4 million and including eight partners. Uh, and we all joined our forces uh, aiming to sp speed up land tenure recording. Uh, we used the principles of fit for purpose uh, and we used image-based approach. Uh, you can see that the target countries were Rwanda, Ethiopia, and uh, Kenya. Uh, and we also in included kind of the users and stakeholders opinion. Uh, and also we, we uh, researched the market opportunities and the readiness level of our um, local communities to uh, accept our uh, innovative approaches. So there were more than uh, 60 organizations and community groups and more than 100 individuals that have been interviewed before we started developing uh, our technologies. Uh, in that particular project, uh, we focused on UAV images and UAV data acquisition. Uh, of course, not excluding the other options like satellites and aerial, but in that particular one, we looked at that uh, acquisition method. Uh, and uh, you can see here on the, this video uh, that we have uh, used different UAVs. We passed through platform selection, purchasing, shipping in the three target countries. Uh, we had quite some challenges in that respect, uh, but luckily we succeeded. Um, we had trained pilots in the target countries. Um, also, the aim was that after the project is over, they can uh, continue with this approach on their own. Uh, and this is these are what our pilots on the screen. And this is what happened actually. The project is over, but the activities are still uh, there in place uh, and active. Uh, with this um, slide, I want also to emphasize that by selecting different uh, UAVs, we also analyzed from photogrammetric point of view um, the, um, the influence of the different flight configurations. And we have developed some guidance uh, for efficient and reliable uh, UAV data acquisition. We investigated what parameters can affect the data quality. For example, you can see here the impact of land cover, the number of type points, uh, the impact on the number of ground control points, um, also the different uh, flight plans and uh, um, their configuration. Has, can influence uh, the final result. There are some publications in each of my slides. So if you would like to uh, learn more about this aspect, you can visit the slides. Um, but now I would like to focus a little bit more on the uh, approach related with automatic or semi-automatic boundary instruction. Uh, we aimed at developing an open source solution. So this was the starting point to uh, develop something that is useful on, uh, in the target countries and it's affordable. Uh, uh, by that, we, um, as you can see on the slide, we, um, uh, we integrated many methods, including uh, machine learning methods into an open source tool embedded in QGIS plugin. 
So for image segmentation, uh, we used um, globalized probability of boundary method, uh, which succeeded in detection of uh, boundaries around 80%, correctness and completeness. And uh, we also um, combined it with uh, simple linear integrative clustering, slick per pixel uh, method, which also uh, com contributed to this accuracy. Uh, but at the end, you can see that for um, final contour generation, we used random forest classifier to combine the results from the global BB and the slick method. And by that time, saying in uh, uh, by that combination, saying it in simple words, we managed to reach result that compared to the manual delineation, the numbers of clicks per meters, uh, per 100 meters, is reduced up to 86%. Uh, so this is pretty much of an achievement because our aim with this approach is to speed up the process. And if we can speed it with 60% reduction of manual work, we feel already um, that we have su succeeded with our aim. Here, I would like to just click very fast uh, on the tool to show you how it works. So as I mentioned, it is embedded in QGIS and you can see that there are very clear steps, one, two, three, how to uh, load the image, how to get the um, suggested uh, cadastral boundaries. So these are not final one, these are automatically extracted. And by a semi um, by a semi automatic um, process, the the user can uh, we have developed some uh, tools in addition to the classical uh, QGIS functionalities that the user can automatically edit and after that verify uh, the kind of final cadastral boundary. So it is a semi automatic approach. You have a candidate boundaries. You do a few clicks to accept which, according to the expert, should be considered as final boundaries. And this is how our spatial component uh, finishes. And we switch this into the, um, to, to go forward to the legal, let's say, part of the cadastral data registration. Uh, this was the work done by the project, as I mentioned, it's for land project, uh, but uh, we didn't stop there. Uh, we wanted to uh, improve the machine learning algorithm that was embedded in that tool. Uh, so we wanted to really focus on more advanced methods. Uh, and we, we continued this research with several students. Uh, you can see here on this slide that with uh, one student, we did a method comparison. Um, and uh, we compared um, uh, the methods based on UAV images on two different uh, uh, areas. Uh, you can see the parameters of the flight, the forward over up, uh, flying tide, the number of the tiles. It has been done uh, in Rwanda. And um, you can see based on the different methods that we have compared, what are the visual results on this slide? Um, as uh, I, I missed to mention that aim, the aim here was to go in an urban area and urban areas are really much more challenging than uh, only um, agricultural land and uh, rural areas. So here we can see the, the, the success rate of these methods and um, their performance. You can see that uh, um, the FCN, the fully convolutional network that the student has been ex uh, experimenting with, with, is a little bit outperforming uh, than the other two methods. And this is also visible also from the numerical results here. Um, the, 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 these initial results were not uh, uh, bad because we could conclude that at least 60, 70% of the boundaries could have been extracted automatically only with the remotely sensed data. Um, you can see also if you want more on the publications. Uh, but um, now I would like to bring you 
uh, to the um, current research that we have on the uh, same topic uh, in collaboration with uh, Cadastre International here in the Netherlands and Claudio Percello, we have a PhD student uh, that uh, will focus uh, in the coming years again on this topic. Uh, first, we will start by uh, exploring the opportunities in the Netherlands by combining and creating a benchmark data set. You can see on the slide that uh, our student is uh, going to focus in aerial imagery with 25 centimeter resolution, super view imagery, planet scope, sentinel, and all this uh, will be done in uh, the Netherlands. Uh, we have quite some rich data set here, also cadastro data set to explore. Um, so the tests, will be done here, but we aim to um, transfer this approach into other countries uh, with um, similar um, input data source. Uh, also, what else is planned uh, is to test machine learning algorithms on this bench, uh, benchmark data set, like uh, uh, frame field learning, you can see on the left side, and also you can see that we will explore uh, some state-of-the-art segmentation models like vision transformers. Um, all this will be used on this dat benchmark data set to train and to evaluate the models. Another thing that is coming in the future for our research is to include human in the loop. So to test how a human in the loop learning approach will work. You can see here on the slide that we will explore many refinement steps which are used to uh, finalize cadastral boundary delineation. And uh, we will also explore the delineated boundaries if how they are used to train the model and improve the accuracy of these automatically extracted boundaries. So these are our, our plans uh, aiming to uh, really develop, develop a machine learning approach that will be embedded in an open source solution and hopefully implementable in reality in many countries uh, after us. Uh, this brings me to the conclusion. I saw Claudio giving a sign to finish. Sign to finish. Mm, yes, uh, with my talk, I wanted just to share that I found uh, from my experience and uh, collaboration with colleagues and students that uh, um, machine learning and AI um, approach is quite promising for cadastral boundary extraction, which is in general a pretty complicated task. Uh, and of course, we have a, a variety of uh, sensors and platforms that uh, provide us enormous opportunities to explore these uh, um, this, um, methods but there is still a lot of work to do. It's not a simple thing. And uh, we have many challenges that we will uh, further explore like scalability, like transferability, and the, mainly the implementation in practice. We want to create something that will be useful and will not remain only a research, a nice research publication, but really implemented in reality. Thank you very much. That was the final slide of uh, my presentation. Very good. Thanks a lot, Mila. And uh, thanks for pointing out all the challenges that we still have uh, to, to be able to extract automatically these boundaries. I hope this will inspire our remote sensing community to <laughs> yeah, work harder to, to make tangible solutions uh, for, for land administration. This brings us uh, to the third speaker for today. So thanks a lot, Mila. I will now would like to invite Didier to uh, share his presentation and enlighten us about the work he has been doing. Thank you very much, uh, Claudio. Um, can you confirm you can see my screen? Yes. Thank you. By the um, way, I sorry. Uh, I invite also people in the audience if the, they have questions, they can already um, put their questions in their chat. They can already do that. And the end of the presentation, that we will have a discussion. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, my task is going to be very easy because uh, I have a very good foundation from Rohan and Mila. 
And what I'm going to present here is uh, uh, some of the practical experience of use of uh, Earth obs observation in the land tenure security. And I'll base this presentation from my experience in Rwanda, as well as in Zambia. Uh, but before I start, um, I'll just to tell you who we are, um, I'm working with Medici Land Governance, which is uh, a public benefit company, which is leveraging different technologies, uh, frontier technologies, including what uh, Mira was mentioning, the AI, uh, blockchain, and other types of technology to benefit the security of tenure and the land administration. And we, our, our mission is to help individuals establishing formal ownership uh, of their lands and properties. We have a couple of uh, products we use. Uh, we, today I'm going to focus more on what we call ENAM, which is our, our systematic land titling um, uh, product or, uh, or, uh, or solution. But we also have developed a um, uh, room which looks at the land evaluation and taxation. And we use a lot of the AI for detection of boundaries of properties, but also boundary uh, and uh, also extract uh, uh, building footprint. We use uh, blockchain to secure public records, but also we have uh, products related to land administration system for countries that have already done uh, the first registration or needs to have a proper land administration system. We are working right now in, in Zambia. I'm talking to you now from Zambia. We have, um, we have done some work in Rwanda. We have done some pilots in, 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 in Liberia, but also working right now in Guyana, we have done some work in St. Kitts uh, and Nevis, uh, in Tulum, in Mexico. We are working uh, with uh, New York City uh, with the blockchain of their properties, but also in Wyoming, in Teton County, in the United States. Now, let me go deep into the Earth observation. What I'm going to focus on is how Earth observation is, is, is helping systematic land titling. And as I said, I'm going to base my experience from what we did. Um, I participated, I was privileged to work in Rwanda. Let me take you 14, 14 years back uh, when uh, in Rwanda we used, uh, we, we hired street survey to do, to carry out aerial imagery using uh, aircrafts. Um, and also we combined those images with some, some satellite, high resolution satellite imagery because it was, um, uh, very not easy to, to mobilize aircrafts. Uh, took us two years to cover the whole country, um, basically due to the weather and also getting the different permits for overflight permits. If you have to fly an aircraft um, across uh, across borders, it, it's a lot of um, bureaucrats to get there. And basically not easy to mobilize uh, uh, imagery acquisition using aircrafts um, uh, during that period. Right now in Zambia, we have now looked at uh, the, um, what solution can we come up to capture most recent imagery. So we have a fleet of um, uh, drones. We are using wind trials, uh, EBs and RT drones, RT transition drones. And we're uh, acquiring five, centimeter, five to 10 centimeter high resolution imagery. This uh, is easy to mobilize. We have uh, the pilots uh, we are using right now in Zambia are all uh, uh, Roco trained pilots. And um, uh, we can be able to get as recent as uh, recent images to go right in the field so that uh, the features on the ground have not changed. So now, I, um, Claudia, uh, you mentioned about fit for purpose, uh, uh, but also um, uh, Rohan and uh, and Emira mentioned about these. What we have found, people uh, on the ground, they are easy to recognize features on images. That's the first point we need always to understand. So it's always easy to show to uh, local people, uh, individuals in their, in their communities, images, and it's easier for them to recognize the, uh, some features on images. The Fit for Purpose Land Administration talks about also um, not, not about the accuracy. I always give this example that uh, my grandmother who, who's 98, uh, she doesn't know what is a centimeter accuracy, but she knows that her land is from that tree to that corner uh, where there is another tree, because sometimes a lot of people, even in the rural area, as well as in urban areas, they have features on the ground to determine where, where the boundaries are. In Rwanda, uh, 10, 14 years ago, they used uh, printing maps, uh, printing images on, on, on scale. 
and then go in the field and people can identify the boundaries, then use a, pen, a pencil, then later on a pen to capture those, uh, the, the boundaries. So you could see here uh, a woman with papers trying to identify with a parasevaya. Uh, this is someone who only did some uh, 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 primary school, uh, secondary school um, um, education, doesn't have to be sophisticated surveyors, identifying boundaries on the, on the images and drawing them. And uh, from those images, we were able to digitize them. You remember the first image uh, on, on my right here, which did not have any boundary. After digitization of the boundaries that were captured by those surveyors, you could now create a, 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 an index of the cadastral uh, map. And uh, so when we go now to what we are using right now in terms of technology in Zambia, now uh, we are, we are using, uh, we have started exploring how to use AI to detect boundaries where possible, where we have um, uh, uh, features on the ground, but where, where there, is, there are no features, we have a process we call pre-vectorization, where we have our staff in office trying to uh, determine what will be the, the, the boundaries before we send now enumerators in the field. And when we send enumerators, these are uh, people who have now tablets and we have loaded in those tablets the pre-vectorized images, uh, sorry, the pre-vectorized boundaries um, with a backdrop of um, the, uh, the high resolution image. And these people can uh, now go into the field, verify boundaries with neighbors, capture also the information. Uh, Rohan talked about uh, uh, document, uh, documentation of uh, ownership. Um, so they captured who is the owner, who are their corners, what are the particulars of those people. And uh, uh, we take great um, uh, importance of also involving women and making sure that uh, for those families that are uh, living together, there is a ownership recorded whenever it is happening. Uh, another area where we're using images is when we do what we call public display and the community verification. When we go into a community, then we put all these maps on the wall, then people can come and check the, um, there are uh, the, the properties that were captured. This is done when we have checked the information. We have uh, data checking processes, both spatial and the texture data. Then people can come. We send them SMSs. They come to a designated uh, place in the, in, the, in the community. Then they can review the captured information on their ownership, their boundaries. They can also be able to identify who who's where and um, when necessary, we also in this process have adjudication teams trying to uh, mediate disputes that are existing in the communities. In Zambia, when everything has been captured now, we have developed a system that uh, is used by the government to do all approvals into the system. Everything is done into the system. Uh, we have eliminated the paperwork. So from the council, the councils, because in Zambia to be able to have a title, land has to be planned. So Part of the work that Medici does in Zambia is also planning. We produce land use plans for local areas. We produce also layout maps. So, and that, these are approved by the council. So the council have access to the, to the system. The surveyor general office has access to the system. The commissioner land office has access to the system. Then they review the different data that have been captured uh, in the field. And then by approval, there is a production of operators in case of Zambia. These operators now are assigned, uh, are assigned electronically since uh, February. Initially, they used to be signed um, uh, um, with a wet signature or manually, which was causing a lot of uh, logistics and painful signing. But uh, Zambia passed a law allowing the use of uh, electronic signature for land records. Once the, <clears throat> the operators are uh, issued, then we take these operators into community to, to, to be distributed. Everyone uh, receives an SMS to come and collect his or her operator. Then these people can also be able to pay for the titling fee. Uh, for information, titling fee is around 3,000 uh, 3, kwacha, which is almost, uh, 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 almost $150. Uh, but uh, people to be able to get a title, they only need to pay a minimum fee, which is 1,000 kwacha, which is almost $50. And uh, this payment can be done through 
uh, agents in the community. They, uh, now we have linked the national anti-tattering system to the local bank, uh, so people don't have to travel to banks. They can pay through the booth in the community uh, uh, without traveling to the banks. Once uh, payment is made, um, then uh, the uh, chief registrar and the registrars can go into the system and then approve uh, for titling. Approving for titling comes with um, um, uh, applying electronic signature to the title. Here I have uh, shown an example of a title. Then we take all these titles again back to the community. And in one of the picture there, you have the permanent secretary handing over certificates of title to landowners in, um, in a place called Kanyama here in Zambia. It's one of the most densely uh, area in, in, in Zambia um, uh, uh, where people have now obtained the uh, titles. So with all of these now, I'm try we're we trying here to talk about um, sustainable development goals and security of tenure and health of preservation. So I want to talk about what has been impact of all these, the use of these, um, these images as a starting to let people get um, uh, uh, certificates of titles or uh, their, land, uh, rec their land rights recorded. So in Zambia right now, we have been, we started this project in October, 2020. As of, uh, as of the end of the month of September, we have produced 58,000 titles in the hands of people. And we have, uh, we have uh, around 140,000 uh, operators that have been distributed. So as people continue to pay the minimum fee, they will keep continuing getting the titles. Um, when we looked at these numbers and uh, we tried to uh, disaggregate them by gender, because it's also one of the, uh, the SDG indicator 5.8.1, uh, we found that 56% of, uh, of the properties that received uh, titles have at least a, uh, a female as associated owner. Uh, and um, you, you have on another side in Rwanda where we did the, the program, I, I, I was privileged to participate in. We did it for five years and uh, we acquired imagery for the entire country, 26,000, 20, 20, 26, sorry. Um, uh, and, then, and then we have pr we produced uh, 11.4 million uh, digitized parcels and 8.6 million parcels um, uh, received the titles. And they are the number of um, women associated with the titles. There we have 86% of um, uh, titles uh, have at least a female as an associated owner. Now, before I, I go to, 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 towards the conclusion, I want to show that uh, uh, these images, this earth observation is, is, is helping the better cadastral, uh, uh, cadastral uh, system in Rwanda. Uh, I used an example. This is exactly my property, where, what, which I own in Rwanda, which I show on, on the screen there. I, you can, using the UPI, the unique pass identifier, be able to know what to do where and who owns what in Rwanda. In Zambia, they are, they are building the national that spatial data infrastructure, which is also uh, receiving all the, document, the, the spatial data that we are producing as, as a project. Um, as, a, as a conclusion, I want to um, uh, talk about three things. Uh, in terms of challenges. Number one, uh, countries to be able to adopt whatever we're talking about here, they need uh, changes in policies and laws. And sometimes you have um, uh, countries that their laws are only limited to uh, traditional surveying me uh, method methodology. So they need to adapt the survey laws to allow the use of imagery, the use of fit for purpose, the use of general boundary principles and so on and so forth. Again, there is also um, a sensitization of professional bodies, especially the, the surveyors and the lawyers to accept these types of um, uh, 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 activities in terms of recording uh, secures of tenure. Um, I'm glad to, 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 to say that Zambia now is participating in a, in a pilot with a UN Habitat to start collecting data related to SDGs um, in terms of secures of tenure. Last week, last two weeks, there were there was a team of uh, people from um, Kenya at UN Habitat in Zambia trying to collect all different data so that they can be better reporting for for the the, the SDGs indicators. So I want to stop there. Uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Over to you, Claudio.
Thanks a lot, Dieter. It's really great to see the work you are doing. It's really nice to see the whole workflow, the whole uh, cycle, let's say, from the acquisition of the images up to the uh, certificates uh, of ownership given to the owners of land. That, that, that's great, the work you're doing. And um, really nice to see how this, this concept may be of fit for purpose or in general using uh, remote sensing can be used effectively. And then very nice to see these examples from uh, Zambia and from uh, Rwanda as well. Um, yeah, I would like now to open uh, the discussion. And um, well, I see already a question uh, from uh, Jeroen. And it's a question for Didier. Uh, what proportion of the total processing time is dedicated to parcel delineation? Thank you very much for the question. Um, the the, the prevectorization of uh, parcels uh, is done using QGIS on images. Actually, it's very fast when you have uh, the boundaries visible uh, uh, rather than when the boundaries are not visible. and. Uh, we are glad to say that also have uh, high quality images, five centimeters to 10 centimeters. So the boundaries are really, really nicely visible uh, to, to be, be able to do that. Uh, right now, I think um, our, um, our, uh, our GIS team can do uh, around 500 to 700 parcels in a day in terms of pre-vectorization of the boundaries. Um, maybe something else I wanted to add is uh, we are trying to quantify um, and see how, what is the cost from end to end and uh, of, of this process. Uh, but this is also depending on uh, different, it's country to country. So what we have as a cost in Zambia, different from the cost in Liberia, cost in Rwanda. Why? Because sometimes um, we also have, uh, uh, in Zambia, we are, we are doing extra mile where we are doing the planning, which is not um, a, a, in other countries. So we are looking at uh, one parcel getting up to $35 to complete end to end process. Over to you. Okay, thanks a lot. Yes, uh, I see also um, uh, Emmanuel that is raising his hand. Uh, I think you can, um, if you like to unmute yourself and, and ask your question. Thank you, thank you, Claudia. Um, this question uh, is to, I think directed to Mila or well, even Rohan can comment. Just the issue of the um, artificial intelligence, uh, the AI work around uh, boundary definition. Uh, while AI is going on, there's, there's the feeling by some that um, when uh, boundaries are defined, uh, when you're doing it using AI, you tend to also capture uh, boundaries, for instance, maybe of a, a house, but the cadastral information actually is the boundary of um, um, the property, not necessarily the house itself. And so when you do that, you tend to have these kind of confusions uh, where in a, in a property, you might have three houses and those three houses are all captured as uh, cadastral parcels. How do you deal with those kind of issues? Thanks, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Emmanuel, uh, for the question. Um, yes, this is true. It's a very complicated way to, it's complicated to extract the exact cadastral boundaries automatically with machine learning or any other AI algorithm, uh, especially because, as you said, um, sometimes it can capture the, boundary of the house, but we also know that the boundary of the properties can be uh, overlapping with the um, with the border of the house or the, the wall of the house. So sometimes it's beneficial to have this. Sometimes uh, it is redundant information extracted from uh, the AL algorithm. So it is true that sometimes uh, uh, AI or machine learning can extract more than what we need, uh, but this is why it is a work in progress. So we are continuously trying to train, to test, to uh, improve the methods 
so that um, the redundant information uh, is not selected as part of the boundaries. There was a lot of research uh, on edge detection. There was a lot of research that was extracting boundaries, but they were not uh, linked as polygons. Uh, and we were aiming to, to develop exactly um, methods that can extract close polygons. There was a lot of research passing through segmentation and extracting um, uh, raster data. And now we are trying to uh, go forward with only vector data, but also high quality vector data, which really doesn't capture uh, redundant information. So it's not an easy task uh, and we work on that, but we, I still think that uh, the result that we have been reaching of so far, if it uh, can be 60% useful for to speed up the process and to be in, incorporated in the QJS tool or other open source uh, uh, tool for data collection, if this can be done is still a benefit is beneficial for to speed up this cadastro data Thanks. capture. If I may add a little bit on this, because um, if you see also the results that Mila presented, typically um, segmentation and classical edge detection methods have problems in detecting the, the cadastral boundaries because they detect all edges in the image, including the edges of the houses. But if you look at the results of deep learning methods, convolutional neural networks and um, fully convolutional networks, the results tend to be much more accurate in the sense that they are trained to detect only the edges of interest. So they are trained to detect only the cadastral boundaries. And if you see the results of the fully convolutional network, they really ignore the edges of the house because the, the model is trained in a supervised manner to detect only the cadastral boundaries. Of course, there are still a lot of limitations, but it is a huge improvement with respect to classical edge detection and segmentation methods. Okay, I see there are more questions and maybe because I know that Rohan has to leave in uh, maybe five, 10 minutes, there is one yeah. for yeah. Rohan. Can you take that one? Shall I read it? It's a rather long one. Yeah, I, I had a read of that one. I'd also like to comment on Emmanuel's good, good question and the, and the good responses from you and, and uh, uh, Mille, uh, Mille, Mille, sorry. Uh, the, um, yeah, I, I think it's a, a, a really good question because um, one of the special things about the cadastral domain is that we really uh, aim for 100% completeness and correctness. Whereas in other types of mapping, be it topographic or uh, street road mapping, we're, we're a little bit more tolerant on putting a, a data set out there where there's a bit of error. Okay, we'd like it to be 100% correct as well. But when it comes to cadastral boundaries, and that's usually the most uh, valued asset that uh, a citizen will have, we're not really going to tolerate any errors in the database. Of course, there is, but we try to minimize that. So the the, the, the work on that going on using AI um, and I've seen different and improving results, you know, 60, 70 percent uh, um, true positives returning. That's great. But um, I think at the moment and that will continue and Miller and, and, and you, Claudio, will continue to do such work. Um, but but at the moment, it's, it's still going to need that intermediary. And I think the original ideas around the use of um, AI were to Use it in those contexts where you're going to do a, a like Didier showed you, you know, 10 million parcels in three years. Well, there's an awful lot of work that went on there, um, sketching in those boundaries and getting those validated. But if you can use an AI based approach to give you a first cut or a rough cut of, of a particular area and take that into the field, um, that gives you a head start. And if that process of, of uh, run, running the analysis, extracting the boundaries, and then taking it into the field beats the process of going into the field and sitting there and either walking all the boundaries or sitting down in a big group and, and re-sketching out all those boundaries where you've made a gain. And if you multiply that by a million parcels, you know, or a couple of years worth of field work, you may make significant gains. So I think that's that's where the initial idea of using this approach has come in. And I think we'll see it develop as it gets higher accuracy. I think we'll see it used more for change detection type work and, uh, um, and, and improving the existing data sets. So I just wanted to comment 
comment on that good question from Emmanuel. Now, another question, and I think that's uh, Evangelia from ITC, I think if I remember, uh, you, on the way to finishing a PhD by now, I think Evangelia, you're asking me about my, uh, one of the diagrams in my slide deck, and I won't put it back up, but it was one where I put some statistics up about this zombie statistic about the 35% or the 25%, you can see I'm jumping around all over the place too, and what those circles represented. Uh, what I will say there is those circles represented a very rough go at trying to highlight where the cadastral divide, that is those countries that don't have complete coverage um, or, or much coverage at all in terms of either uh, legal registration or mapping of cadastral parcels. Um, and so it was no in no means uh, meant to be an accurate um, depiction, it was more intended as a graphical depiction. And if you look really closely at that uh, map uh, of Angelia, you'll see that Australia is not even on it, I think. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a poor, poor um, graphic, really for uh, demonstrative purposes about where the main areas of the cadastral divide are. Uh, so, but thanks for the question. Good that you picked me up on it. <laughs> Nice. I see there is also um, another question that, again, is for you, Rohan, is about the areas of no data in the maps you are showing. And that's, yeah, quite worrying. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's a map from, if you look look at the, I think it's UN indicators, um, webs, yeah, so UN SDGs tracking stuff. Yeah. So I can find you the, I think it's on the actual slides. I think we're going to distribute the slides. Is that right, Claudio, or by me made available? We, we um, can, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to distribute, but there's links on each of the bottom of the slides. You can see where those um, where those graphics came from. So I agree with Simon. It is a bit strange almost that we've got so little data on on that indicator 1.4.2 relating to um, percentage of 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 ten, tenure coverage. I guess we we would call it. Um, and it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't mean that there um, isn't data there. It seems to me that's more of a pipeline issue and an availability issue. Who's, and, and that probably comes back to national statistics agencies, which are not always your national cadastral agencies. And, and rarely they are. And often there's not much communication between them. And obviously there's a, a great deal that needs to be done there uh, because going back the other way. So on the one hand, we want the uh, cadastral agencies to be pumping that data to the statistics agencies to be reporting on the SDGs or reporting in general about national development. Uh, but on the other hand, it's often the national statistics agencies that are doing the census and has got have got great uh, uh, person level data, but also uh, location level data on where people are located. So matching up of that people register with the cadastral register is an area where many countries could improve. Uh, but a good question from Simon and good comment. And I agree, it's somewhat concerning and strange that in that very public website, it looks like over 70% of the countries don't have any data and we're seven years into the SDGs adventure. Yeah. Maybe that's a problem of really reporting or collecting all the data. Um, one, one question, we, we have seen great examples of uh, Rwanda and Zambia. I was wondering if, uh, I don't know, Rohan or Didi or Mila have an idea of how much this, this approach of land administration based on uh, images is applied in, 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 in other countries. Do you, do you have an idea of how many countries are looking for this kind of solutions? Uh, I'll put up a I'll start on it and then I'll let probably Didier is, is well placed into it. And I think Miller as, as well from the R&D side. Um, there is, so we saw, and I, I think Rwanda's always held up as a really good example of where at least from a technical side, the whole process was shown to be you know, cost effective and done in a relatively short amount of time compared to previous adventures where it had taken decades to get only a fraction of what Rwanda managed to cover. Um, but there is more and more documented cases um, of FFP um, being applied. Uh, and in a sense, there's nothing new about the FFP concept. It's, it's fit for purpose. It's one way of expressing quality, which is the fitness for purpose of, of the needs against the system design. Um, but the link I'm going to just chuck up in the comment section, you'll see examples from uh, China, Vietnam, Indonesia, Nepal, Uganda, uh, Ghana, and Namibia, 
uh, Benin, Mozambique, uh, even South Africa, uh, Ecuador, Colombia. So, it, and a lot of those are attached to donor-driven projects around uh, land administration development. So, increasingly, the larger donors like the World Bank are demanding to see an imagery-based approach used, um, and 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 more uh, creative use of 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 the labours and skills that the country already has, um, making use of generally often you know large populations that are able to to do this um, community-based mapping uh, so there is um, uh, many so at least in this uh, special issue that I'm just putting up there in the in the chat box from the land journal you'll see I think around 30 different cases there uh, Didier or, or Mila do you want to comment as well no, I think you covered it uh, you covered this very well um, I just want to maybe answer to the question from Evangelia about uh, the template for SDG 1.4.2, uh, if there is a template. I, what I know that uh, UN Habitat has developed uh, some correction tools and reporting mechanisms on the, on the set of land tenures in, in, in countries to be, able to, to, to be able to capture data on these indicators. And five countries in Africa have been uh, chosen as, as a pilot and testing of these tools. Uh, those include uh, Zambia, I think, uh, DRC, um, there is uh, Senegal in, in the West. There are other two, which I don't remember by head, but uh, this, this shows that uh, at least there is something being worked on uh, on this in this end. Um, I, before I give back the floor to Claudia, I just want to respond again to, to the questions from Emmanuel. What we did as, as, as a company, we, we are planning to have an A-B testing to look at if pre-vectorization is done by AI, uh, the detection of, um, of boundaries versus using our normal processes of um, uh, using the, the, the GIS team. And um, uh, for us, the interest is, is in the time. What is the time taken to pre-vectorize uh, an area? Uh, when I say an area, when it's say 5,000 uh, boundaries versus when, when you're using AI or when you're using, uh, when you're using human uh, digitization. We are much more interested to know how we can save time. We know at the end of the use of the artificial intelligence, you always have to go back again, cross-check this data. So we will be we'll be doing this A-B test and documenting it. Maybe in a year or so, we'll be able to write something about it, which can can uh, can inform the research. Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. And um, yeah, I was wondering if been doing all this uh, really interesting work and collected a lot of data and was wondering if some of this data could be made publicly available. I mean, for the use of the community and you know also Mila and I are very much interested in further developing automated or semi-automated methods that has been already mentioned. Fully automation is not really uh, an achievable goal, but semi-automation and making the process more efficient. So do you think it's possible to make some of this data publicly available for the community? What do you think, Didier? Uh, I, I mean, understand that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. So, so at the end of my presentation, I showed some, some where some of the data can be obtained, but I know uh, some countries are um, like Zambia. You mentioned is uh, working on national spatial data infrastructure and these other different uh, uh, access to the data. Uh, this this uh, depends. Sometimes it depends also on the country policies in terms of data uh, sharing and and uh, who, whoever is the owner of the data. Uh, if the data uh, Rohan mentioned, uh, uh, some of the projects are sponsored by. Uh, by maturatism or, or, or big big companies. So whoever is owning the data, putting it available, that's that's what will guide. But there is there is no it's there is no uh, no one solution for all. Yeah. Over to you. Okay, thank you. I see also well there is a one comment uh, about uh, data for the Arab regions and. Yes, so they can be found uh, on uh, our blend uh, initiative website. There is one. Um, yeah, that's comment. a good comment on the Arab land region and the Arab land initiative. Definitely using SFPI approaches as that area develops. 
Um, another question from Cillian. Land tenure security directly impact food security and environmental sustainability. How GIS and remote sensing can be applied to assess those impacts? For many African and Asian countries, it's still an issue. What could be done to improve this? What could provide, wait, I lost, an effective land policy now? Who would like to answer on this on this question? So impact on food security, environmental sustainability. I think uh, the, the question is is absolutely correct, or more of a comment from, from Silly on the, the role of um, of not only cadastral land administration information, but the use of remote sensing imagery more generally absolutely um, supports um, food security responses and, and climate change responses and don't have to read or look too far to see to see that in the news or um, more specifically in our in our scientific works. Um, um, but going on to the rest of the question, it's, it's, um, you know, we could sit here and talk about land consolidation, we could talk about land degradation monitoring and so on. Uh, and, and the cadastral parcel, the, the land, the property rights layer, or the resource rights layer, um, or minerals cadaster off, is all part of that equation. So um, in terms of improving it, there's um, a whole, whole different range of facets that need to be taken into account. I'm not sure if you heard of the Framework for Effective Land Administration or the Integrated Geospatial Information Framework. These are both from the UN GGIM and, and they uh, package up a set of nine separate pathways to, to sort of link uh, finances with institutions, with um, legal uh, standings of the data and the management of data, with the data itself, processes around data, making sure governments and citizens and uh, private sector are in partnership, ensuring capacity development, training program, communication and awareness. So the full, the full gamut of change management really to improve the, not only the management and creation of spatial information, but its broader use across government. Um, so I, that, that's where I'd invite you, Cillian, to go and have a look. If you're not aware of those, um, it's a really good starting point uh, that builds from the previous NSDI work, but also shows that direct link into SDG's response. Okay. Uh, can I add on that, that uh, the Regional Center for Mapping of for Resources Development based in Nairobi is also working on this. There, is a, there are a lot of projects on the remote sensing and agriculture, trying to estimate the yield of the field before even the, 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 the season is over. So that's also somewhere to look. And I also want to mention that in the case of Rwanda now, they are using uh, all the, uh, the cadastral information to provide inputs to farmers because they know who owns what and how much they own and how much input they will need when they are doing their, 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 their farming. All these because they, at the beginning, there was those images that provided the systematic land titling and, and get people to have security of tenure. There is also another element in terms of environmental sustainability. Whenever you provide security of tenure to the people, they will invest in protecting the land because now they, they know they own the land. So it's always, in, in that type of um, uh, um, eye, we need to look at it. Thank you. Thanks a lot for adding this information. Very useful. I know that the Rohan has to has to go. So I would like to thank a lot uh, Rohan for his presentation and answering all our questions. And thanks a lot for being with us. If I see a few more questions, so if others wants to still uh, stay with us for a few more minutes, we can continue. Thanks, thanks a lot, Claudia. And thanks a lot, everyone. Uh, yeah. And, and I, I'm sorry to jump in, Mila, because I, I, yeah. I did have yeah. to bounce. But thanks, Claudio, for putting the session. And thanks for all the attendees. And if there's any questions or follow up directed at me, I'm more than happy to take them offline. Thanks, thanks very much for your time, everyone. I think it was very interesting. Thanks a lot. And uh, but yeah, if people are interested, we can continue a little bit the discussion. We can have uh, 10 more minutes. And I see a nice comment from uh, Simon and uh, giving some uh, idea of data sharing. So organizations like Land Portal Foundation are useful for sharing data and provided the data is open access. Thanks for, for this uh, information, Simon. Um, Claudio, may I share a little bit on the previous uh, discussion? Just, sure. uh, just a sentence because uh, uh, Rohan and Dide added about the food security and environmental sustainability. But there was one aspect that I wanted to add, and it was a little bit in the presentation of Dide about the women land rights. 
Uh, and in African countries, uh, women are very much involved in the production of food and in the farming and so on, but often they are not owners of the land. And uh, there were studies that have been kind of uh, supporting and thinking that making them owners will make them even more responsible and even more productive and, productive, and this will lead um, to a higher impact in terms of food security. Just an aspect that I wanted to bring in because yeah. it was not mentioned in the previous, uh, in the previous speakers. But I think there are more questions. Um, yes, I'm trying to see. I think we have covered. Uh, so there is one question. Can this type of survey be done by anyone or only qualified land surveyors? Maybe Mila, or can you reply on this question? Yes, or? I can. I can start, Matt. I see the smile of Dida. Maybe you also can add after me. So overall, overall, the fit for purpose approach that we are kind of targeting is to uh, to train the not only the not to use only trained and professional land surveyors, but so called to train the trainers to to train the local community to map their land uh, also themselves. So with easy to use tools, with uh, affordable tools, with a bit of assistance and a bit of training, um, the idea is to also use non-professionals to jump into this uh, fast uh, um, data collection. Um, yeah. Maybe Didi, you can also add on this. You. Thank you very much. Um, you, you put it rightly. Uh, in Rwanda, we use what we call para surveyors. These are people who can read the maps, who can know how to, to uh, we train them to draw the lines. In Zambia, we are doing the prevectorization using people who uh, are, um, have uh, knowledge in GIS, uh, but also we, we, we try also to have uh, surveyors working with us so that we control the quality of the work so that uh, we abide to the cadastro, uh, the, the, the survey acts in, in the laws. So it's always good co to combine, uh, have some co some level of control, but use less qualified people because you cannot have surveyors in all, all over the countries in, in the world to ensure that the security of tenure is done. So that's the, that's the way we should look at that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had one, one other question. Um, I saw a lot of examples using UAV images. And of course, with UAV images, you can capture really very high resolution images at, uh, down to uh, one or a few centimeters. Uh, my question is, is it needed or you think uh, we could uh, work well also with maybe aerial or satellite images where the resolution is uh, well up to 50 centimeter maybe, but maybe in the in the range of 50 or one meter resolution do you think that 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 could work well or we need the uav images um so i i, I will look at this in, uh, in three dimension number one if you are going to uh, urban areas uh, uh it's 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 best to have high resolution in urban areas um and depending on uh, the second the second part is uh, depending on how, how much is acceptable by the surveying community in a country in terms of accuracy. Sometimes they, they have laws that are accepting some, some level of accuracy um, in terms of uh, the, the position. And we need also to look at that and that will influence. So if you have a hundred, uh, 10 meter uh, resolution and one, two centimeters, it's, it's always going to be a difference. The, the third one is, the how do you acquire the images? You know, so sometimes drone UAV images acquisition is faster than getting uh, to to mobilize an aircraft or they redirect a satellite, and you can have images that are most listened. So it will depend on. Uh, then, then when I come back to the first one, when you go for rural uh, rural land, and let's say for example you want to establish. The boundaries between chip domes and or the boundaries between very large piece of lands, uh, which uh, let's say 100 hectares piece of lands or more, or even hectares of land, then you don't need that high resolution. You can you can use uh, you can use the low resolution satellite imagery. Over to you. 
Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, maybe one one question uh, is more for for Mila. How do you see the role? Uh, we already discussed a little bit, but how do you see the role of artificial intelligence for for producing this uh, cadastral maps? How I'm very enthusiastic and very passionate about it. Uh, maybe because I really would like to see some innovative methods uh, that can be embedded and really um, show their impact in practice. So I see quite high the role of these uh, uh, technological advances. Not only uh, nowadays, AI is in everything. In every single domain, it is making a great impact. Why not to use it for cadastral mapping? I strongly believe in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, with you and the students in the group, I, I would be happy to go forward to in this research together. Yeah. I see a big role, short answer on your question. <laughs> okay, thanks. Well, I, I agree and I, and I hope uh, indeed that, um, yeah, the, the combination of course of technologies can contribute to make um, acquisition of cadastral data more efficient, more effective. Um, yes, I see nice comments. Uh, thanks, Diviani. Uh, thanks for all participants. Did I miss any question? I see also some nice comments and that they're saying uh, also similar cases in Lesotho. So there are also some uh, activities going on there. Yeah, okay. Uh, Thanks. I would like again um, to, to thank all uh, the speakers. Uh, Rohan left already, but thanks a lot to Rohan, to Mila, to Didier. I think it was a great uh, combination of expertise and different viewpoints from academics and from people working in the field uh, and, and acquiring data and going through the whole cycle of acquisition of uh, land rights. Um, I'm very, very happy to, to that we had this conversation all together and a very interesting discussion. Thanks a lot also to the participants for all the questions and really the, the lively, lively discussion in the end. Thanks a lot. With this, I would like to, to close this, this webinar and I hope I'll see you for the next uh, webinar that we are still have to plan. But uh, as I said, this is a series of uh, webinars on Earth observation for the SDG. So I hope uh, to see you again in the next uh, in the next webinar. Thanks a lot and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks for yeah, yeah, thank, thank you. Bye bye. Thank you everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.